With me in Cambridge, Massachusetts is Asif Bitterman. He is the Associate Director of MIT's Sensible City Program and the founder of Super Pedestrian, as well as the co-inventor of the Copenhagen Wheel. Now we're going to talk about that wheel. This is an interesting project, Asif, and I have to say I've got to admire the publicity that you have generated, but that's a question near the end of the interview. Let's, first of all, welcome to EV World. Hello, hi Bill, thanks for having me. It's great to get you here. Um, let's start off just be, to begin with, for our listeners to, in case they're, they're not familiar with Copenhagen Wheel, and they'd have to be on another planet not to be, I don't think. Um, tell us, give us a little bit of a history of, of, the, of the project. Um, the Copenhagen Wheel started from a partnership with the mayor of Copenhagen back in 2009. Okay. Where we asked a very simple question. It was almost a one-liner. How can we get more people to cycle? Okay. Now, at the Sensible City Lab at MIT, we are a multidisciplinary lab. We focus on cities and we ask how cities can become better if you start to think about them as if they were programmable things, like right. computers are programmable. What happens at the intersection between digital technologies and the physical environment we live in? So with that kind of mission statement in mind, we went to address the question of how can we get more people to cycle? And we realized that once you go beyond a certain distance from the city center, people don't bike so much. There's a big drop. Actually, 15 kilometers on average. Right. If there's a hill on the way to work, people don't want to get to work sweaty. And I'm talking about, you know, when, when, when you start to think about massive movements, uh, um, uh, something that could rival the, uh, let's say, the intensity of how we use an automobile. Right. right. So put aside infrastructure, it seems like the sheer physical effort, topography itself, uh, is, a big, is a big determinator of whether somebody would get on a bike or not. That makes sense, right? We've built most of the cities we live in, we live in today for the scale of the automobile. Distances are very large. So it turns out that the distances or topography in general will be a big determinator on whether somebody uh, will cycle or not, which makes a lot of sense because the cities we live in today are quite big, right? They're built in many ways to the scale of the automobile. Right? Distances between home and work are quite large. You can't just walk. It's hard to just cycle for most people. Right. So makes sense. You need to put a motor on that thing. Right? <laughs> and, and with that in mind, we went and looked around and we saw that e-bikes are actually a booming field. We didn't know. Right? That was 2009. Right. Uh, for us, uh, we, were, we were learning. We're not a bicycle lab. Right. We're focused on technology and we have a lot of engineers, but uh, our point of view is of urbanism and the, in the intersection between urbanism and computer science. So with that in mind, um, we, we started exploring electric bikes and we saw that it's a multi-billion dollar market in Northern Europe alone. Tens of millions are selling in China, mm -hmm. Japan and Australia yeah. are being, we all know the story. The yeah. uh, US is, is, is growing rapidly. But we also had a feeling that the solutions that were out there had a limitation. From a control stand standpoint, they almost tried to mimic uh, a moped, even if you pedal. It was much more similar to the experience of riding a motorcycle than it was to the experience of riding a bicycle. Okay. So we said, let's use the, let's say, let's use, let's take technology from the world of robotics and apply it to bicycles so that our users could cycle like they use any bicycle, but just make the hills disappear or make the distance feel like it shrunk. Right. So that was sort of the idea that started developing in, in our mind. And let's make it a, desire, a desirable consumer electronics product, a fashion object, right? Something that could make your bike beautiful if you put it on. Right. And uh, we decided not to rethink the full bike, just to rethink the back wheel. The bike is great, right? Plus, on, you know, if you, put, if you make an e-bike, right, you're already gonna put on it 10 plus pounds of equipment, you're not going to use a 900 gram carbon frame uh, aerospace grade, right? You're going to use an average frame, a commodity, right? So why rethink that? A commodity is a commodity. Let's rethink 
where the value is. Right. Which is that in, in, in this technology that we wanted to bring from the world of robotics, something that will deploy sensors and machine learning to understand how the rider behaves and then integrate the motor with his or her cycling motion seamlessly. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, and from there on, with that brief in mind, we started developing the Copenhagen wheel, which ended up uh, uh, a red disc with a motor, right. which is also a generator, a set of batteries, uh, and an embedded control system with a whole bunch of sensors that can accomplish what you and I just talked about. So, so the role of, of Copenhagen, did they provide funding or was it just the, the catalyst for the idea then? Copenhagen is one of the most advanced cycling cities. Right. More than 55% of the trips there are done by bike in the city center. There are more bikes than people. There's 1.08 <laughs> bikes per person. It's significant. They've right. made a huge investment into cycling. And they, we partnered together. So MIT Sensible City Lab partnered with the mayor's office back then. Okay. And uh, together we defined the question. Then they gave us funding to develop the initial prototypes. Later, we got additional funding for, uh, for the project from the Ministry for the Environment in Italy. Uh, and in general, we thought that if you can get more people to cycle in Copenhagen, you could translate it elsewhere because they've already picked most of the low-hanging fruits. Right. Right? Exactly. So, all right. So you mentioned on your website, and I found this interesting because I came across this piece of information even just before I found on your website about Steve Jobs and how Steve Jobs was basically inspired by the by the um, multiplying effect of a bicycle to the human body. If you look at efficiencies and things like that, he said, it's amazing that, you know, a, a human being isn't all that efficient in, compared to other animals and species, but if you give them a bicycle, you suddenly multiply that effect. And so that was sort of the, the design philosophy behind how they design things, how they engineered things, was whatever we do, we want it to have that multiplying effect to the, to the human being. So how does that apply to super pedestrian? Uh, first of all, that's a great question. And if I had to almost to rephrase what you're saying, because he, he was referring to human locomotion. Right. right? So to, to, to us versus animals when it comes to the efficiency of moving around, um, and we weren't at the top of the list, but with the tools we developed, bicycle is a tool we developed, we came way ahead. So, and then they wanted to think of computers as another tool, or like you said, something right. to multiply our capabilities. Um, and, um, and by that enable us to do more and more and be more efficient, uh, et cetera. The Copenhagen wheel, in a sense, is a way to expand your reach, your capability, right? So all of a sudden, you can cover greater range. You pedal just like you do. But the idea is that all of a sudden, you can go farther. It's not about working out less or working out more or recreationally using the bike. It's about getting people to start cycling as a choice for their daily needs, making it a competitive, attractive option. And if that's the case, people need to be able to cover those long distances from home to work. So it's very much with the same philosophy in mind that if you add that little twist, put in that red disc, all of a sudden, your capabilities are multiplied. You can go farther, you can climb a, a hill. Uh, the digital, through the, uh, through the smartphone control, you get enhanced capabilities to interact with other cyclists, uh, to, to communicate with the city. You get information about things that cyclists care about. Okay. So uh, let's talk about actually the engineering of this thing then. What was, you started in 2009, you began to bring the robotics piece of this into it, the cutting edge technology. What was the biggest challenge that you had in, uh, in, in designing this? So back in 2009, the, the first thing we wanted to do is, is a proof of concept to see if we can make something that, will, that, is, that you can package into, into the center of a rear wheel, so something that's small enough, light enough, but also something that can give you that riding experience we were talking about, something that's agile enough and that's in its response, 
uh, uh, something that can break you intuitively, electronically, right? So that wheel will not only push you, but also break you. So braking also kicks in and out automatically. Okay. Uh, and that's where you regenerate energy. So the very first iteration was to see if, we can, if you can put together components so that they achieve that goal. And if you can write the software from a control standpoint, that can actually make the machine function seamlessly vis-a-vis -vis the rider. Iterations that followed try to have uh, tr tried to deal with the adaptability to different types of bicycles. We had a version with a coaster brake and torque sensors. So integrate a mechanical coaster brake with a electronic regenerative braking. Okay. Not a simple task. How do you do an in-hub gear with all that, with, with all the other components? Uh, working with derailers and changing the weight, reducing weight working with different types of battery. Eventually, it worked more and more toward, uh, it moved more and more toward being a task that's about what engineers call, imp call impedance matching. To make sure that all the components in there uh, do what we want them to do, but also fit each other in the best way. Okay. Uh, and, and when the technology sort of matured after two or three years, uh, during which time MIT filed patents on the project, uh, and it got some attention around the world, uh, we got to the point of having released about five different types of hardware. So from a Cosmo object, first prototype that aims to show us if it's even possible to do what we want to do, all the way to, to something that already costs within reason from the standpoint of the cost of goods inside the, uh, uh, the wheel and still achieves most of the stuff that we achieved with a spaceship version, right. uh, the first version. Let, well, let me ask you, wh what's the advantage, and, and the term that the industry uses here is all-in-one, AIO, uh, for this particular design. What's the advantage of that as opposed to you guys just saying, because there's lots of companies that make electric bicycles where they stick an electric hub motor on, they put a battery either behind the seat, over the back wheel, wherever they locate in the frame, uh, in the seat post, all different kinds of strategies involved. Um, what's the, why not just take that approach? You know, just a more efficient drive motor and a more efficient battery. Why in a single hub? What was, what was this thinking there? We were thinking, so t t take the uh, approach of somebody from a, who's outside the bike world and looks at bicycles and says, well, these are such efficient machines, right? They are great. Like Steve Jobs said, they are you know, some of the most amazing uh, efficient machines we're using today. We did not want to rethink them. That's number one. You're right that if you distribute the components all throughout the frame, you can get more efficient weight distribution, for example. Right. But the, the fact is that between two to four billion people on the planet already bike, a lot of these people own a bike already. So if you think of the bicycle today as something that, and most of these frames are, are average frames from the standpoint of quality and performance, they're good and they're just good enough. Right. Uh, we're saying keep your bike, install that new capability, okay. augment your capability, keep your bike, it changes the cost model. An average electric uh, bike today in Europe costs 2,600 euros. It's a yeah. lot of money. You can buy a used car for that price in the US. That's if true. we want to change the world and see massive numbers of people starting to convert some of their rides by car to bicycles, it cannot be at 2,600 euros. Right. right? So price is a direct uh, result of this. Also, ease of installation, right? You can just, you pop it on. You might need to tune the derailleur or something like that, but you pop it up. There's no need for wiring, special hole in the crank, right. special space for the battery, special frame, none of that. Well, let, let, let's talk about that because one of the debates that was had, you may be aware of this, that there was uh, you know, this debate going on within the electric bicycle industry among some of the industry leaders about this type of technology, this all-in-one wheel technology. And the concern was is that Whereas I can have a dedicated battery and you can have a 750 watt motor uh, and that gives you, you know, enough 
torque and enough range that, that you've got a bicycle that exceeds a regular bicycle's performance. Mm -hmm.